How was the falafel? Amazing. Delightful. Good. Thank God. Um, tonight I want to talk about uh, asceticism. And um, I want to do that because we're starting the Christmas fast uh, on Friday, day after tomorrow. And uh, <clears throat> I guess the question is, why in the world are we doing that? Why in the world are we going to fast? I mean, isn't this the time when we're supposed to be feasting sumptuously during the holiday season? That certainly seems to be kind of the, the spirit of the age. But in fact, we are supposed to be feasting on the feast of the nativity. And for the, uh, the days that follow, right? And then we fast again for the feast of Theophany, the baptism of Christ, and then we feast again. And so this period now that we're entering into is the Nativity Fast. It's 40 days in America. Thank God we have a blessing. We take a break for Thanksgiving. But uh, <clears throat> during this 40 days, we are supposed to be in a season of preparation. So what in the world is this preparation about? Is this some you know new Orthodox idea or something like that? Or is it possible that it's an extremely old idea? Of course, anybody who's known, who's read the Old Testament knows that the Old Testament is full of fasting and preparation, and Jesus himself would speak very clearly about the expectation of these things. So I'll just give you a quick example uh, from Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Moreover, when you fast, I'm not going to stop there, when you fast, the expectation of Christ was that his disciples, those listening to him, were going to fast. <clears throat> that they would know that there would be times of fasting that were prescribed. In the Didache, uh, which is a very, very early document, it means the teaching of the Twelve, uh, it says that the Jews fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but as Christians we fast on Wednesdays, and Fridays, Wednesdays to remember the betrayal of Judas, and Friday in honor of the crucifixion of Christ. That was the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, that document. So, the art of fasting, if you will, and, and asceticism is as old as the faith itself. Going back not just to uh, the, the time of the Apostles, but going back in and through the Old Testament. We see, if you, if you don't read the Old Testament... Take the time to do some reading, and you'll see that God prescribes that we refrain from certain things at certain points. And of course, Jesus doesn't come to abolish the law. He says, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So it's not that you're not going to fast anymore. It's that you're going to fast with understanding of what we're doing. You know? uh, so I'll go back to that, back to that uh, verse in Matthew. He says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces. It literally means they contort their faces. They are trying to make everybody see what they are doing in their fasting. They want everyone to see them suffering in their fasting. It says that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. They get what they want. They're being recognized for their austerity. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Okay, so Jesus recognized that already the Jews were fasting. And he says... There are people who are doing this the wrong way. Don't be like them. What I want you to do is anoint your faces and go about your life so that nobody looks at you and, and realizes that you're fasting, but you're just going about your, your daily business in the fast. What does asceticism mean? It literally means to train. We're in training. So if you are in training, you are, an, you are referred to as an ascetic. We have great ascetics in the church who 
go down in history for their asceticism, their, their, their training, their purpose, that they knew that uh, what was waiting for them in the kingdom was far more important than the things that they were putting in their mouth. Uh, and of course, we could use other examples as well. You know, some of them fasted from speaking. Uh, they would fast from, from, um, uh, from, from, you know, parties. We're still told, like, during the, the fasting seasons to abstain from, you know, gleeful, joyful parties, uh, 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 joyous events. It's a little bit of a struggle in our culture because at work, everyone's like, oh, we're going to have a holiday party. They don't even call it a Christmas party anymore, most places. Yeah, we're going to have a holiday party, which is ironic because holiday means holy day. Yeah, we're going to have a holiday party. A win we'll have a winter break party or something. I mean, it's starting to get so absurd, it's almost hard to bear with it. You know, I mean, how much can you try to skirt around the word Christmas? How hard can we try to do that? Everybody knows it's Christmas. But, you know, if they do that long enough, people will begin to forget. People will begin to forget. I remember that uh, my daughter... Nina, who we named after Nina, the Enlightener of Georgia. And of course, I wanted to name Hannah Georgia so that Nina could be the Enlightener of Georgia. <coughs> but my wife won, and so she's Hannah. And I love the name Hannah. Uh, so Nina, we named her after a female evangelist. And, um, and we thought this would be a great idea. You know, her, 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 her grandparents are evangelists and want to share the gospel and that's a wonderful thing so we named her Nina and anyway so she joins a swim team and we have this commute to and from Brown County you know it's 25 minutes each way and so you know I would drive the van you know part of the time and the kids would all be in the back and they're talking you know you hear kids talking and and so my daughter's back there and it's almost <laughs> Easter uh, Pascha and uh, so the girl so my daughter looks at this girl sitting next to her who's on her swim team and says, hey, um, what are you doing for Easter? She says, Easter? Easter? Wait, Easter? I, I know Easter. Isn't that the time when the Easter bunny raised from the dead? <clears throat> That's what she thought. She thought Easter was when the Easter bunny raised from the dead, rose from the dead. No joke. I heard this with my own ears. I almost pulled the car over. <laughs> what on earth? But this is what happens. If you sow stupid seeds long enough, Right? If you, if you try to change the culture long enough, if you try to take Christ out of things long enough, eventually there's going to come a generation that thinks the Easter Bunny is the hero of the story. It's the same thing with Santa Claus. You know, the church, in our church, in the Orthodox Church, we still, I hope most parishes do, I don't know, we do here, celebrate with fervency the Feast of St. Nicholas. Right? Right? December 6th, we're celebrating St. Nicholas. We have St. Nicholas night. When St. Nicholas comes and brings gifts to the children and candy canes, you know, these traditional signs and symbols that are supposed to point us to Christ. But what have they done? They took St. Nicholas, who was an ascetic, a bishop in modern-day Turkey. They took him. They made him fat. They gave him rosy cheeks. And a sleigh pulled by pretend flying reindeer. And <clears throat> his job is to fly around the globe and bring presents to people. And when you talk to people about Santa Claus and you try to connect them to St. Nicholas, that connection has now largely culturally been completely shattered and obliterated. People are like, Saint Santa Claus means St. Nicholas? Right? Why? Because when you try to, uh, to to bleach the the holy reason for the season out of the season you try to do it long enough and culturally it's not like uh, like I love Santa Claus I used to lay on the floor beneath the Christmas tree and wait for him to come down the chimney in the middle of the night and I never caught him it's, it's not that that's not fun to have cultural celebrations like that I mean it's it's fun but if Saint Nicholas replaces Christ and, I mean, if, if Santa Claus replaces Christ and St. Nicholas as, as he's the center of the season, right, rather than waiting with bated breath, breath for <clears throat> the liturgy of the nativity of Christ, we're waiting with bated breath for the fat man to come down the chimney 
and bring us our goods. It's, it, I think it, forgive me, but it, it almost shows a, a, a sense of hedonism. You know, like I celebrate this season so that I can get good stuff. I'm not anti-gift giving by any means. But we have to remember, why do we give gifts? Because Christ is the greatest gift that was ever given, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the gift of Christmas. And so we give gifts to one another to celebrate that gift. Anyway, I don't mean to go on a rant or a tirade. It's just one of these things that we have to remember why we do things. We can't culturally forget. We have to remember. And the church, we have the responsibility of continuing the traditions of our fathers that have been handed down to us from the earliest days of the church. And that's why orthodoxy looks so weird when people walk in, because they're used to stuff out in the world. They're used to, to what you know religion has become elsewhere, or uh, the absence of religion in, in uh, secularized society. They're not used to walking in and being like, their, their senses are blown away. Okay. So asceticism, it literally means exercise or training. Training for what? Training for what? Drew? I'm not sure. Oh, come on. Uh, training for what, Thomas? Eternal life. Okay, good. That was a good stab. Let's keep going. Training for what, Mark? Your salvation. Training for your salvation. Good. What happens, though, on the road to salvation? Oh, spiritual battle. Uh, it's a battlefield. Asesis is training for the spiritual battlefield, right? So that's what we're doing. You know, <clears throat> if you're in the army, it's not like you join the army and they hand you a gun and you go out and fight a war. They put you in boot camp and get you in shape, and then they continue keeping you in shape, right? They don't let you get fat and lazy, right? They keep you in shape. Asesis literally means training. That's what we're doing. We don't want to get fat and lazy. We want to be, uh, as the baptismal service says, Preserved a victor, a warrior invincible against all adversaries. That's what the prayer is. That we would be preserved a warrior invincible against all adversaries. And that's talking about spiritual warfare. So where does this come from? Let's go back real quick to the words of Christ in uh, Luke chapter 9, <coughs> verse 23. Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. I love that Luke includes daily. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Not, it doesn't say take up your cross once, put it on, and then say, I'm a Christian, and then go back to living your secular lifestyle. That's not what we do. We'll become spiritual schizophrenics if we, if we try to live that way. Sunday morning, I'm a Christian. The rest of the week, I'm, uh, uh, I, of course, I'm a Christian. I have a cross on under my shirt. Right? We have to live like Christians. We have to breathe like Christians. It's really important. And it's a war. It's not easy. It's not like we get the chrism, and then all of a sudden it's like, I'm invincible. It would be great. <clears throat> Can you imagine how great that would be? Man, I'm in. I'm done. That was it. Let's go be saintly in the world now. Wow. So it's a battle. It's a battle, and that battle requires continual training, which is called ascesis, asceticism. Somebody who practices asceticism is someone who is in this training for this ongoing spiritual warfare. So Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. And denying ourself <clears throat> is one of the main forms of asceticism. Deny ourself. Deny yourself what? Well, deny myself that bacon cheeseburger that I want in the middle of December. It's not time yet. I have to deny myself. Deny yourself what? You know, deny yourself those deviled eggs at the at the at the secular non-holiday party. <laughs> you know, <laughs> unless someone says, "Would you like one of my deviled eggs?" and that's the thing: is somebody offers you something, then you take it. You say, "Thank you very much." There was a story about St. Macarius the Great, he didn't drink wine because he was an ascetic and he didn't want to drink wine. And so he went to this, uh, uh, this, this cell and there were these monks there and they wanted to give him their very best. And so they brought him a glass of wine and set it down in front of him. He said, thank you very much. And he began to sip on it and an hour or so passed and he had finished it. And so uh, they, the, uh, one of the monks goes, to get him a second 
a glass of wine and starts to, to bring it over to him. And St. Macarius' cell attendant stops him and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, the master, his wine is gone. He's drinking it, he must be enjoying it. He says, don't you know? He says, he'll drink this because you offered it to him, but then he won't have any water for three days for each cup. Don't give him another cup. Because he was an ascetic. He denied himself, unless it was offered to him, and then he would take it, but then he would skip water for three days. Deny himself. We deny ourselves comforts. I mean, St. Herman of Alaska is a great example of this. He denied himself the simple comforts of life. And uh, he slept, what does it say? That, that he slept with his head on a stone as a pillow, and he slept under a board as a blanket. There is nothing comfortable about stones and boards. I tell you, I mean, and I find myself complaining if Anthony crawls in bed with me and takes my blankets, and I'm like, man, my toes are getting cold. I'm, I find myself complaining that my six-year-old wanted to stay warm, and so he took my big fluffy blanket. And St. Herman has his head on a rock laying under a board in Alaska. Alaska. <clears throat> deny myself take up my cross and follow Christ take up my cross what does it mean to take up our cross take up our cross means to take that suffering that is before us right? uh, St. Paul refers to this thorn in the flesh that he had and he besought the Lord three times that it would be taken away. And the Lord's answer was, my grace is sufficient for thee, if we want to use the King James. Because my strength is perfected in weakness. So when we are weak, God is strong in us. The um, taking up our cross is very difficult. With, perhaps the most difficult aspect of taking up our cross is not complaining about it. So hard. Because at least if you can complain about it, you're like the guys who are contorting their faces while they're fasting. Because you want people to know. Like, I am really suffering right now. My car, man, it's on its last legs. I wish I had a new car. It stinks when I drive down the road. And <clears throat> we find things to complain about, you know. And complaining can be cathartic. You know, you're like, I feel better. I just complained in a room full of people. But in fact, really, what we're supposed to try to do is not be complainers, not to have a spirit of complaint, but to have a spirit of thankfulness. It's like St. John Chrysostom. Today is his feast. And what does he say as he is dying in his second exile, three years in exile? Does anybody know what was the last thing he said as he lay there dying? Sergius. Glory to God for all things. Glory to God for all things. He didn't complain and say, that blasted empress sent me out again for preaching the true gospel. He didn't say that. He said, glory to God for all things as he lie dying. So I didn't want to speak <clears throat> very long on this. I, I wanted to just give a, a, an introduction to this topic since we're beginning the fast this week. And if you are not yet Orthodox and you haven't talked to me about fasting, talk to me about fasting because if you're not Orthodox, you don't just jump with both feet into the deep end of the pool and say, I know how to swim. Okay, you got to work into the deep end of the pool. So if you have not talked to me about that yet, probably email me uh, and, and I'll talk to you about your fast this year. Um, a book on asceticism that I love that I eventually will recommend to everybody, but some of you are not there yet because we haven't finished the initial four books. The Way of the Ascetics by Tito Colander. This is like a handbook for the battlefield. It's just a little thin book. That doesn't look very scary, Father. I mean, that's just, how many pages are, look at the size of that print. That can't be that important. Wrong. <laughs> this is the, it's, it's the teaching of the great desert and ascetical fathers on the spiritual battles of the soul boiled down into a simple language that everybody can understand. That's why Tito Colliander produced this book. Because he wanted to take the ascetics 
and boil it down so that any man or woman could read it and say, oh, yeah, this is in a language I can understand. And by the way, like I said, the print is big. Each chapter is like a page and a half. And so when, you, when it is time for you to undertake this, if you haven't already done it, you know, you read just a chapter a day. I tell people you can read it five times if you want, but just read one chapter a day because it is so dense and important. He doesn't waste a single word in this book. He chooses every single word so carefully so that by the time you finished a page and a half, you're going to be scratching your head being like, can I ever do that? But it's step by step by step. And it's all a process of growth. I'd love to tell you I can walk on water. Can't do that yet. Okay? I don't know if I ever will. It's a process of growth. I'm the chief of sinners. We work through the stuff and hopefully grow a little bit as we go in our life. This is my copy. I have a hardbound, one of the rare hardbound copies. And it is so marked up because I used to um, do uh, uh, youth retreats for teenagers on the way of the ascetics and the matrix. Um, <clears throat> so that I flew around the country doing that for a couple of years when the matrix was a big thing. Because when I saw the matrix, by the way, I'm not you know, saying everybody go see the matrix because I know there are things about the movie that are difficult. Um, but when I saw the matrix, I literally, all I wanted to do was go and pray. And I did, I went home, I was staying at a B, a Airbnb or no, they didn't have Airbnbs. It was a bed and breakfast <laughs> without the air. There was no air involved. <laughs> Uh, and I remember going back to the bed and breakfast and walking in and closing the door and just raising my hands. I just felt like I was on fire because the spirituality behind that movie, it's a real spirit. I just felt like I was watching the Desert Fathers on a big screen. Even though some people watch it and they're like, you're crazy. There was no desert spirituality there. I'm like, go read the Fathers. Go read it and then go watch the movie again. That's how I felt. And no, I, I don't think I'm going to give that uh, retreat here anytime soon. <laughs> <coughs> That's all I had to say. I just wanted to, to, to give you that little intro for the coming fast and see if anybody has any questions. No hands. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the fast for us that are not Orthodox yet, do you prefer us all to be the same thing or do you, is it different per person? If you're all in the same house, then uh, generally speaking, We'll try to streamline it so you're not cooking three or four different meals for three or four different people. So, but that would be a good thing to email me about or just ask me afterwards. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, in one of the sections of the way of the ascetics, there's an emphasis on not sharing their spiritual journey and yep. the details, something good, something bad, with anyone but your spiritual father. Right. Um, so could you clarify for us that a little bit, which connects to say mark and i are out to eat and he or maybe i want to can you have that for your fast what's your fast yada 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 is it a good idea for all of us not to ask anyone it's yeah. no one's business it's no one's um, business but you but it was between you and your spiritual father yeah really important you don't talk about your fast with other people because there are different reasons that people have for being prescribed uh, a uh, an altered fast right could be health it could be mental health it could be the, where they are in their spiritual journey. You know, they might just be a newbie who showed up. It could be their past. I mean, it, it could be, there's any number of things that only a spiritual father will know that nobody else will know, which is why we don't talk about our fasting rules, prayer rules, all that stuff. That's between you and God and me. And um, and that's that's for, for the protection of each of us. Okay, Mark? This is more of an observation than a question. Okay. In, in the book, he says there's a point where he talks about that. <clears throat> If someone wants to argue with you, let them be right. Mm. And the feeling I got when I read that, I was like, wow. <laughs> I know, you, you're like, that's horrible. I, I can't be wrong. Yeah. And I get the point, but it, it, it really, especially for a guy, you really get the, the sense like, wow, I got to submit. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a key point in that learning process is learning to be obedient, whether it be to your spiritual father or just for the spiritual growth. Yeah. Yes. And you, you see that, uh, I wish I had the example pulled up in front of me, but I don't. But you see that in the Desert Fathers where, you know, people will come to test certain monks and start insulting them. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, and, um, and that, that, again, you're reading about guys. I mean, you can read the Desert Mothers, too. There's not much about them. There's, there's some, but not, not a ton about them. But the, there are these men 
who had left everything, who were living in a cave generally, or, or some kind of a simple cell, and they've sacrificed everything in their life to follow Christ. And so, you know, you're, you're joining them somewhere mid-journey or along the journey, and they have gotten to a place where they're able to say, yeah, no, you are right. That's, that's me. I'm the thief. I'm the, you know, murderer. I'm the uh, gossip, whatever. And, and they're able to, to bear with that. You know, if a newbie comes along and tries to start doing all this stuff right now, you're going to become overwhelmed. It'll just be overwhelming. That's why you have a spiritual father to help you work into it a little bit at a time. Yeah, actually, I think I just read one of those stories you're talking about in the Desert Fathers because he gets called all these different names. And then when he gets called a heretic is when he That's right. flips it around. He's like, I have many things. Agatha, <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I have that up on my computer screen all the time, so when I'm typing stuff, I can click over and read it again. Um, okay, anybody else? Any other questions? Last question. There's another way of framing the translation of ascetic. I, I thought withdraw or flee um maybe come in you're a drug addict you want to flee from that life mm -hmm. towards the faith or you i don't know you're a christian but you realize <clears throat> this activity this hobby is actually not good so you're withdrawing from the culture but i can't, I can't remember what this yeah so is. i mean it, it that can be um, that could be connected with repentance because to repent, metanoia, is to turn around, to change your mind, your orientation. And so you are, you are turning your back, like in baptism, in the baptismal service, when we have the exorcism at the beginning of the baptismal service, then you turn to the devil in the West and you, you breathe and spit upon him. You deny him and then you turn your back on him. You're leaving the world and the devil and all of his stuff behind and you're facing east you faced christ then you you confess christ you confess in the nicene creed as you are marching into the church holding on to the stole of the priest being led by your spiritual father toward the kingdom so i mean the the the, the imagery is amazing it's it's awesome uh not a wasted word in the liturgy the services are just amazing you know so that's in that sense yeah you are withdrawing. You are fleeing. You're turning your back on, on the devil, on the on the west, and you're facing the east. Yes, sir. To what extent um, are we called to maybe testify for our faith versus kind of like getting into like a defender of the faith kind of thing? Is there like a balance that we can have uh, maybe on the terms of a fast or, or just if we hear someone saying something that uh, may or may not be, uh, say, against the faith or blasphemous or anything? or anything along those lines? Yeah, so good question. So I was talking to somebody today about, you know, St. Paul. St. Paul rode the Damascus experience, uh, you know, then he goes to Damascus to, and he, he gets his, he, he, he becomes baptized and the scales fall from his eyes. And then what happens to him? He disappears for three years. What's he doing in those three years? Training. So St. Paul didn't go to Damascus, get baptized, and then go straight up to Jerusalem and start preaching in the streets, you know. He had a, a period of training and preparation. And um, so when we are in the process of joining the church, the danger for converts, I was a convert so I can speak to it, the danger for converts is as we learn stuff, we begin to try to go and take that stuff and engage other people with it, and what happens, and I've seen this happen, where someone takes this information, they heard something in a homily, or they read something in a book, and they go to their, let's say, their Calvinist friend, and they go, and I got all, and they just give them this line, and then the Calvinist, you know, uh, uh, dogpiles on them, and then calls his friend, and they dogpile on him theologically, and then the guy goes home confused for a week, because he wasn't ready, you know, he didn't have that training, and so... He, we, we have to be careful in that way that we don't take on the role of evangelist as we're still a student. You know, in a sense, we're lifelong students. We're always growing, but we have to be careful that we, um, that we, we, we learn and we are seasoned. And they call it the phronema, that we, we receive that scriptural mind, that orthodox mindset. Um, and that's something that takes, unless it's just imputed by the holy spirit which occasionally happens in the bible here or there where somebody just they have this knowledge like on pentecost you know peter's i mean just amazing um his his homily on pentecost but 
But for the most part, for most of us, it's a period of training that we need in order to be able to make a firm stand without becoming confused ourselves. Does that make sense? And I've seen it play out in action. I've seen guys and I'm like, look, don't go out and do that. And they do it anyway and they come back really confused. I've had a couple of them leave the church over it. So it's awful. It's very, very hard for a father to see. So I'm, I'm out for your protection. Okay. But if somebody comes to you and asks you a question about the church, a question that you can answer, then answer it. And then say, you should come with me and see. Come and see. You know? My bishop used to tell me when I was in, he was my priest then, now he's a bishop, but uh, when I was in college, and I went to a Calvinist college because I wanted to find out what do Calvinists believe, and it was a good college, and it was three years of intense arguing, um, and, and I loved it. I, I, I loved it. I mean, it's a great college, but, but my, my, I would go to my priest, and I would say, man, these guys have all of these in, like intense and intricate, intricate arguments from you know this and that. I just get lost in these arguments. He says, just answer what you can and tell him to come and see. So that's what I did for three years after he told me that the first week I was there. And I had people, we did a, a candlelight readers compline on Wednesday nights. And I would say, just come and see. I, I, there won't, be, won't even be clergy there. We're just going to go and pray together by candlelight. And all these college students would come every week, different ones over the period of three years. And um, so that's what I did. I didn't have all the answers. I was, I was like, I don't know how to engage with what you're saying here. This is totally foreign to me. But they would come and they would hear the prayers of the church. And some of them became Orthodox. Some of them are still becoming Orthodox. I still get emails 25 years after starting college there. I still get emails from people saying, hey, I was in your such and such class. Do you remember me? You told me about St. John Chrysostom and uh, I've been going to an Orthodox church. I'm like, wait. Man, that's been a long time. It's still happening. So anyway, that's not because I'm a great evangelist. That was because I obeyed my spiritual father who said, just answer what you can and tell him to come and see. <laughs> yes, sir. I was thinking about um, what Mark said about the arguing thing and what's going to be right. Yeah. And I was also thinking about how like, in a lawyer in a legal proceeding, you're defending the rights of the innocent. Um, not in a legal proceeding, but just if someone slanders or attacks someone who's innocent, is it okay to continue to defend yeah, them? Right, so that's a different story. Then you're talking about defending someone else. You know, you want to defend the fatherless and the widow. You know, if it is, if it is within your ability to do good, then do not withhold it. And this is what the scriptures say. So if you can defend somebody, you're, you're acting as a defender, that's a different story. Versus, you know, going out, taking your newfound knowledge about orthodoxy and running out and, you know, proclaiming in the middle of the college and then getting ransacked by 12 different people, you know, and then just becoming spiritually confused. So that's a good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. About your fast? <laughs> you always have the hard questions, Hannah. <laughs> what if someone asks you about your fast? You can say, that is, uh, I'm told that that is supposed to stay between me and my spiritual father. What? Good. That's the right answer. Good answer. Yeah. Okay. Stephen, I think I said last question eight questions ago. <laughs> Stephen. What is a non-orthodox person, right, curious about why you're fasting, ask you, why are you fasting? You know, I normally see you get a burger, and now you're flying salads. What's that about? <laughs> uh, I can tell you a little bit about fasting, but what you should really do if you're curious is come and see. You know, I mean, they fasted in the Old Testament. Jesus fasted, and he told the disciples they were going to fast. The, the apostles, you know, they fasted. They the teaching of the Twelve Apostles from the beginning of the second century, which was oral tradition, which was written down early in the church, says that we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. I mean, then throughout the church history, there's, you know, the, the, all of these different fasts of the church developed very early on. You know, but you should come and see. It's a hook. Set the hook. A good fisherman. Anyway, and then you can say, you should actually come on Wednesday because they feed you on Wednesday. <laughs> Anyway, all we want people to do is come and hear the truth. And then if they choose not to stay, that's, that's totally their, 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 their choice, you know. People have free will. But we just want people to come and hear the truth. So, 
Good questions. All right, guys. You've been lovely. Let's uh, stand and pray and thank God. <clears throat>